My very special guest is a world-class facilitator of change. He's an author, speaker, entrepreneur, and director of Econic. He has spent the last two decades evolving the who, the what, and the why of Fortune 500 companies and venture-backed startups. He is Joshua Berry. Welcome to the show, Joshua. Woo, Matt. I'm excited to be a part of your expanded circle. You and I go way back and we have been through a formative experience together in that we wrote our books right around the same time. You're, you're exactly right. Uh, you know, there was a big cohort of people that were writing books. Uh, you became one of the best people and one of the most optimistic people, I think, as I was going through some of the hard times of what all this uh, really was at and the hard work of writing a book. So I'm so excited that we got to the finish line. We both have our books out into the world and we get to talk about them. It's so true. And it's if it, if if anybody's listening, you haven't done it, it is a labor of labor and love, but it's mostly labor. But uh, when you find somebody like Joshua and myself and a couple of others in the program, really, really great. And I'm excited to talk to you exactly about the book. And so one of the things I would say is that I first met you and I like, as you said, we we're in a cohort we're working on programs. I said, oh, what's your book? And he says, dare to be naive. And I thought, wow, what an unusual word, naive, to find in a business book. So my first question, Joshua, is what drew you to being naive? Yeah, I, it's it's definitely not the way I was brought up or not what gave me a lot of success in life. Like I was typically the one who was rewarded for being the smarter one in the room and always having the right answer. And it wasn't until, you know, some of the time stubbing my toes in those ways that I started to learn that this intentional desire to maybe not quiet those voices that sometimes came up in my head that others might deem as naive, but actually might be coming from a deeper spot within me, that those were the things that actually made me unique and, and were some of the you know, best ideas that were brought out into the world. A lot of our work uh, that we do has been around innovation and helping people launch new products or new business lines. And so we're constantly being asked, how can we get people to be more curious and more creative? And what I found is that sometimes it's you have to give those people permission to be seen as naive or let them choose to lean into things that others might seem as naive to actually get some of those breakthroughs you have for business. Hmm. Uh, so many times I talk to business leaders are like, we need to really up our creativity. We got to get more agile. We need to up our innovation cycles. And I say, great. Do you, how, how do you celebrate mistakes around here? And they go, oh, no, we don't let people make mistakes around here. And you're like, absolutely, well, not quite going to work out so well. <laughs> yeah, you're exactly right. If you can't intentionally carve out a space uh, where it's safe to be able to put out those things that might be unpopular or even seen as maybe unsophisticated, you're not going to really have some of those breakthroughs that companies need to be more adaptable and agile uh, in an environment like this. A lot of times as consultants too, we're taught the power of a question. It's really good to ask questions because if you get it, that's one thing, but you have to help other people get it. But those questions typically come from, well, I already know the answer, but I'm going to just ask the question so that you can get to the same place. This is something totally different when you talk about being naive. It, it is. you know, As you and I uh, were doing all the deep research for our books, uh, I know you and I were both out there doing interviews with people. One of the patterns I saw in the interviews that I was doing is those businesses who were doing well in business, but also doing well through business. There was a common pattern that a lot of those leaders told me in the interviews, uh, this might sound naive, but, and then they started to share an interesting idea or business philosophy or whatnot. And, and that is truly what then became this, this seed of, well, why are these people always afraid of being seen as naive? Where is this fear coming from? Yeah, it's so true. And it's something that I did not appreciate when I first started my book project which was all about enlightened leadership, it's fear is what destroys everything good inside of relationships and therefore organizations too. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about fear and you just mentioned it, why are we so afraid of being seen as naive? It, it, it's like as kids, we don't have that fear, but later on we, we do. Yeah, you know, part of it I think is evolution, right? Being kicked out of the tribe or being seen as different is something that intuitively is scary, right? Like I, I need to fear those things or I need to fight for something. So I think part of it is natural inclinations to stay within the box. I think, um, you know, you have written a lot on this too, how organizational structure was 100 years ago, all the good that's come out of that, but also how we're in a stage right now where we need to be questioning a lot of those things that were really built on a command and control sort of approach. And command and control you know, required almost a certain level of fear and, and sometimes manipulation or coercion to be able to get people to do things that the business might need, but maybe isn't always the best for the people or sometimes even the consumer. And so 
it, you almost have to start to understand that that fear was a part of the machine and the recipe. And so, of course, those things that might come across as naive or overly optimistic or idealistic or different than the way we do things around here would be those things that would cause us to, to naturally be afraid to pursue. I think a lot of times as leaders, we're told, you know, you're, you're expected to have all the answers. You know, you're the expert. You're the one who's in charge. You're the one who's in the senior position. And that all, you know, is fine and well, except for when we do need innovation or we need to do something we've never done before, or, you know, there's a global pandemic and no one has the answers. And all of a sudden you don't have a history of saying, it's okay for me not to know all the answers. Like, Absolutely. And especially if you want to grow or scale your organization, the best visual I've ever seen of that is, is like a, a triangle, right? That as you're getting promoted in the organization, a lot of times it is due to your competence and knowledge of things. There's a certain point where you have to then start to go back down the other side of that, that triangle, that mountain. And actually you pretending or assuming you know everything ends up being um, a barrier to actually your growth in an organization or the organization's growth. And so the best leaders end up being almost more the anti-hero or the anti, is that a Taylor Swift song? Right? Do, do I hope so. References I really for hope so. <laughs> um, when they're the people who are able to say, I don't know, or being open to maybe having an opinion of the way things are, but being more committed to learning than being right, right, in the roles that they're in. You know who would benefit tremendously from this, and it'll never happen, <laughs> is when we take our individual contributors who are so competent, we turn them into managers before we really ask, are, are they even want to be managers or are they any good at it? And you can you imagine the first day on the job if they said, look, I just got promoted. I know I was your peer yesterday. Now I'm in charge. I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah imagine if happen, you created that. Yeah, it would be liberating. That. That'd be amazing. <laughs> It'd be amazing. You'd have to work in an organization that had so much psychological safety that everybody felt totally comfortable just, just putting it out there. I'm just saying here, everybody, I'm going to figure this out. But right now, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that hits upon, back to the fear of being seen as naive, I don't, I'm not proposing that people go back to that childlike state of complete naivete. In fact, in the book, I talk about it's a third stage of life, right? You have childlike naivete. We get uh, told that there's a right way to do things through school and through early work. It's a third stage of life that I call chosen naivete. And that can be to that first time supervisor, as you said, can say, I know a lot of things. I know how we used to do stuff. I know how we want to do these things going forward. I'm choosing to say, what don't I know? Or what could be better? Or how might we do these things? It's so, it, it's, it's a balance between these things. It's not a binary. I, I was blessed in being knocked on my ass by midlife crisis, global pandemic, all kinds of things all at once. And it forced me into that, that mode where you're like, I don't have all the answers and that's okay. What yeah. a gift. And I think that it's, it's one of those things where, you know, that type of forced naivete that kind of gets into that. It's not like I forgot everything I'd ever learned over decades of life. It's just that that everything I knew wasn't going to get me through what I needed to. So I, I'm really, really liking the way you frame that up. Well said, well said. And one of the things that I talk to leaders all the time is about intentionality. And this is something that really came through in your work in particular. And you have this framework that it's very simple, but it's very powerful. And I really liked it. It talked about intentionality as it pertains to our beliefs and our actions. I wonder if you, how does that work? Can you just tell us a little bit about uh, that type of intentionality? Yeah. So part of my book, it's a little bit different in that it doesn't tell you exactly how to do the things. The whole book is meant just to poke people, uh, to open up their heads and their hearts a little bit to do exactly what you said, be more intentional or have intent behind the things that they're doing. And, and that's really what I saw of those people who said, oh, this might sound naive and then you know shared some successful business practice is that they had taken the time to say, this is the way things have always been done. Do I actually believe that's the right way to do things for me or for our organization? And they created space to be able to say, oh, no, this is actually what I believe. And now how does that manifest itself into uh, whatever the thing might be? And so what you're referencing is some work that I did during our writing program to go back to the work of Byron Katie, uh, who'd come up with some things more on the personal and, and, and mental side of things to say, how might that work in a business setting? to truly understand what are our practices and specifically what are the beliefs that those practices are built upon. And so it's it's a four question framework that says, you know, if, if we're saying 
everybody needs to get back to the office. Okay, why do you think that's the case? Well, because if I can't see people, I can't trust that they're actually doing work. Great, there's a belief statement. The four questions would say, if you really wanna be intentional here, where did you learn that? You know, if I can't see them, I can't trust them. Is it really true? And then really critically, what do you gain and what do you lose by holding that belief? And just that simple act of, of being a little bit more objective and, and creating a little bit of reflection space for that, I think helps leaders to become uh, more intentional in their approach. It's, it's incredibly apropos because when we move so fast through business and we're trying to always get to the next horizon and absorb all that change, the time to pause and sit and get still using my mindfulness terms, but to reflect, to use your term, it, it's so exceptionally rare. But what I love most is that you talk to people, you interviewed people who were doing amazing things. And this was the common practice they had was to reflect. Absolutely. And, and many of them were all right admitting that just like you did, there were periods of life where they practiced things in a new way. And because of that, that active reflection, even if sometimes it's because they got knocked on their ass, as you said, the ability to do next something that uh, built their self-awareness and their ability to be still and say, huh, what else is trying to come through here is what allowed those people to continue to adapt and, and, and have greater impact through their work and through their lives. Now, when I got toward the middle of your book, you have chapters that you end with reflection questions. And they're the same questions that we were just talking yeah. about because you present us with a series of prompts, if you will, but then here comes the reflection opportunities. And I'm always big on books like yours that teach us things, they connect us to people with stories, but the other thing is that they they put us to work a little bit. So my question for you, Joshua, is when you think about this, what led you to include those types of request, those uh, reflection questions in the book? Yeah, uh, it's it's a, a little bit of what I hinted at before. And no offense to you or any other people out there who wrote books in this other way, but I in the program I got to a spot of thinking like the world doesn't need another book saying here's the eight characteristics of being a good leader or here's the things you need to go do. What I intentionally wanted to do was write a book that prompted people to think for themselves, not to adopt something new, but to adapt and to practice how to adapt. And so yeah, what you're referencing is the whole latter half of the book is parables, research, ideas around a number of different concepts, but it doesn't tell you how to do that or that you need to go do this because it's better than the thing you did. All it does is say, cool, what did that make you think? Did that stir up anything inside of you? Now, where did that belief come from? Is it true? What do you gain and what do you lose by holding that belief? So it, the, it was an intention and practice-based book because I think we all need more space to be able to practice those behaviors that grow ourselves and our businesses. I think it's almost like what's coming to mind for me is there's three states. One is that I haven't really even thought about my beliefs, but my thoughts and my actions and the way I communicate with others are going to be in line with that because they're they're in there. The other is that no, I can articulate the belief, but I never really question like where did I learn this? What made me have this worldview, and what is it costing me, or and what do I have to gain from it? These types of things. And then the other is no, I've actually processed all those things. I took the time to reflect, and I've decided to take this specific course. And that's what so many of the parables and the anecdotes you shared, the stories of people doing some really amazing, thoughtful stakeholder capitalism type things came from that ref that willingness to prioritize reflection. Yeah, you're exactly right. Uh, we have uh, what we call our 5S model in our Evolving Leaders Initiative. And it's, it's it sounds like a, a tongue twister, but it's see, shed, sit, sense, and shape. Oh, <laughs> and the beginning of this is, is, as you just said, just being able to see, become more conscious of what is driving our behaviors. That's step one before you can shed anything that needs to be shed. So then you can sit into that stillness to see what new is trying to emerge. And so, uh, yeah, you, you have to, you have to create spaces for awareness for anything else to happen. So many of these, um, next level leadership practices, uh, they seem so paradoxical when we say things like slow down to go fast, or, you know, what do you mean? If I'm just going to sit here, I, I just told you that the competition is eating our lunch and you're like, and now you want me to sit down and not do anything. And you're like, yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what I want you to do. Because what you were about to do before I got here was not going to serve you well, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just reacting and reacting. Mm -hmm. Well said. And, and especially based on the things that we've 
learned or discovered or uh, you know knowledge that was perhaps once true you know through the first part of our career a lot of what i see now is working with multi-generational uh, organizations right and so you have at the top of the organization you tend to find the boomers and the gen x because we've been around forever and now that's our our station but then we start to say well let me use my beliefs that were formed a long time ago in this current environment, which is totally unlike anything we've ever seen before. And things are breaking down and there's a ton of friction and everyone's frustrated. And you're like, well, what did you think was going to happen? <laughs> That's a great point. Matt, have you seen even the boomers and Gen X who are open to doing that work? Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and I think that, you know, I, I got called to give a talk one time and the CEO was like, we are hiring top talent, Gen Z talent in, and we are managing them out based on the old ways. And the mentality of the people who are in the middle who are managing them out are because they've been listening to us and saying, you got to pull the all-nighters, the 80 hours a week, the this, that, you got to be like me. And the answer is that things have changed and we haven't. Yep, yep, yep. yeah, it's yeah well rare, said. Though. It's rare. And it does also invite that fear of saying, well, wait a second, if I don't act in line with my beliefs, how's the work going to get done? How are we going to create value? How are we really going to be able to hold people accountable? Or how does work even work if it doesn't work the way that my mental model works? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think I also have seen the same thing. It, I don't, maybe easier when younger, but I have seen plenty of leaders older than me who have been able to embrace it. And I would, again, more than half the people that I reference in the book, uh, are, would be people will be considered boomers or Gen Xers who have shown a resilience and an ability to adapt. So it's something that is accessible to all of us. Yeah, I'm enjoying this phase of life where you have enough experience and the confidence that comes with it, but at the same time, you're more willing than ever to open your mind and think about not having all the answers or have that fertile creativity of what comes next. And I feel like our, our certainly our, our senior most executives have earned that right because you know, you're obviously good at what you do, you're you're in charge. But at yep. the same time, being able to utilize that, not just to continue barking out the old orders that got you to where you are, but to take your position and be able to do the type of reflection that you're talking about, Joshua, and being able to say like, okay, is this really the sum total of what this organization can bring to the planet, to society, to our shareholders, to whoever? Like, yeah, what a great question. I love it. And what I would say is, the framework that we shared earlier from my book is applicable in any situation, even the one that we just described there. Because if you're saying or listening to any of this and you're like, no, like I know the right way or this is the vision that we need to do. Great. Where did you learn that? Is it true? And what do you gain and what do you lose by holding that belief? Right. Even even if you wholeheartedly believe what you and I are talking about, Matt, like, oh, yeah, we need leaders who are reflective and can sit and still and go slow to go fast. Cool. Where'd you learn that? Is it true? <laughs> and what do we gain? And what do we lose by holding that? Yeah. It plays out on both sides of it. And you're always going to have stuff that works or doesn't work. It's being intentional in any of those situations and practicing that. It does. And what you're opening my mind to here is that I think a lot of times when we have this clash of beliefs. So as an example, you mentioned return to office. The people who say, no, we should, we can be totally productive and work from home in our pajamas. Uh, that, okay, that's a belief too. Let's do that. Because if all of a sudden we take our beliefs and we just crash into each other like bumper cars and we don't take the opportunity to reflect certain personally and maybe swap notes a little bit, then we're not going to get that level of partnership and that level of cooperation that we really actually do need to get to the right answer as an organization. You, you, you said it very well. And, and I think that is a wise leader. They realize, and I'm going to paraphrase a quote from my book, that Beliefs are merely a mental model. They're our best guess at how the world works. And until you can understand that, you, I don't think you can truly appreciate the diversity of another person's view or beliefs and, and that there's some validity that's coming from that too. You, you need to first, back to what I said before, see and be able to make space for both of those things to then maybe have the more productive conversation about, mm -hmm. okay, and now what are we going to do? Right. And I'll spare you my Buddhist philosophy about the difference between what's real and what's true, but it's very relevant. But I'm going to move us back to your book, which I'm more excited to talk about right now. And that's some of these stories. You include so many great stories. Like I was very happy to see one that I was moved by, which is the, the founder of Patagonia. But I want to actually highlight one that's a little uh, less uh, well known, perhaps, and certainly I didn't know about it. And that was that of Grayston Bakery and Bernie Glassman. Yeah, and I wonder if you just might quickly relate to us. What what was going on in that story? 
So I won't do it justice. Uh, so, so if any of this sounds interesting, go research more. But uh, speaking of it, you know, Bernie Glassman was an engineer turned Zen Buddhist uh, who was looking at his community in the eighties in, in in New York City and Yonkers, and specifically saying, "What could I do to help these people around here?" And he intentionally said, "Is there some sort of job or business I could start?" in order to help people. So it wasn't starting from, here's this great business idea I have. Uh, it started from the reverse of that. And what he focused on was what ended up being a bakery where some of the first stuff they did was brownies. Again, most people probably haven't heard of them, but they are the brownies in Ben & Jerry's ice cream. So if you've had any Ben & Jerry's ice cream, you've eaten some of, of, of Bernie's brownies, if you will. Uh, what's fascinating, though, about their work approach and everything is uh, Bernie looked around and said, we don't have to follow the normal business rules of, of what we want to do here. And, and again, there's a bunch of very fascinating things that they've done. But maybe the one that I'll highlight here is in the service of their mission, which was uh, we don't hire people to bake brownies. We bake brownies to hire people. Right. Reverse purpose there. Uh, they have what they call their open hiring philosophy and policy. And what that means is they don't do interviews. They don't do resumes. They don't do background checks. It's, it's a first in first out, like almost like an accounting, uh, <laughs> sort of inventory process. If you would like a job there, you put your name on the list. And when your name comes up, you have a job at their bakery. Uh, it's, it, I mean, it blows your mind. You have to start to think about what is it that I believe about hiring and somebody qualified for a job? And then again, where did I learn those things and what do I gain and lose from, from my belief? Is, is, there, is their approach perfect? No. And yet they've employed thousands of people. They have trained tens of thousands of people. They have a profitable business uh, that's within the larger 501c3 structure. And they then have found out other ways to be able to serve that community through healthcare and um, you know childcare services and a number of other things that have grown up around the bakery. Wow, that's so cool! I love it. I, lo I love finding those stories. I love finding them on my own. I love seeing it in your book as well. And there was another really powerful chapter I thought, and it was titled "People First. And you talk all about this the traditional emphasis we place on business goals, like why are we here? We're, we're working inside of an organization. And it kind of um, verses or offset by employee growth. And so I guess I just might ask you this question, Joshua. How does this shift work when we kind of put people first in that way? And what could we expect to ha that might happen as a result? Yep. If, if you, most decent organizations will say we put our people first, right? Or we, or, or people are important. Um but they almost always, it almost always ends up as, as long as the business is successful. And what I challenge in that chapter and provide some research and, and stories around this is what happens when some organizations actually put the growth of their people even ahead of business growth and, and those goals. Again, both can be important, but at the end of the day, when you say even over, what do you end up putting in place there, right? Like going back to uh, the, the Bernie Glassman's Grayson Bakery example there, they likely could have a more profitable business if they uh, didn't hire people that needed 100% training right out of the gate. But they've said, you know, we're going to put growth and development of people even ahead of that. Now, there are plenty of other uh, businesses who have also said, you know what, we're going to put the goals of our people even above our business goals. And what work starts to look like once you get out of that is you're required to have better systems for how you operate. You're required to have sometimes better transparency in terms of how we make decisions or when financially things are going well or not. And, and you create a different level of engagement with people and a different level of trust. From a personal standpoint, I, you know, we've we've operated our company out of this way for a long time. And what it means is that uh, sometimes we have people who leave our company, right, for great opportunities. But it also means that I typically hear about it well before most managers would because uh, they're interested in the coaching and the growth and everything that would come around that. And so, um, you know, it's again, it's not a perfect world or approach to it, but work starts to shift in a very different way when you start to say what would happen if people's growth was even or if not even more important than business growth. 
And I like how you tied it together because you brought it back to systems or transparency or things that are business related. It's not as if we're saying, let's make sure that our people are growing as if we didn't have a business. Well, that's no, that's not, not we don't have to divorce it any more than if we want to say, hey, let's grow this business at all costs and not give a crap about our people's quality of life. No, you wouldn't want that either. But I do think what it's nice about it is, well, which one's going to come first? And I think even in my own book, I might have written that uh, when I was in the Marine Corps, they saw it, mission accomplishment, troop welfare in that order. Those are the two priorities, but you're going to get them in that order. And I think this is almost like saying, OK, well, we're not at war here. We can basically say, how do we actually put our, our people first, like you said, but do it in a way that's tied to the business. So yeah. the business becomes a vehicle for allowing people to grow. And then you have a nice uh, you know, reinforcing process there. I, and what what's interesting about that is, and I'm so glad you said that. There, we're not saying and do business poorly, right? right. Because because if if you're not running a good business, that's also not good for people. Right. It's just inviting them back into it, right? Like how we structure mm -hmm. at our company our profit share, how we structure uh, the the lack of approval that's needed for expenses or like paying for your own development things. The, the, they're seen all as elements within a system. And when you start to have people that you trust and that they start to see, oh, if I make this decision, that actually hurts what we could do over here. And that hurts this other person over here. I don't know, you, you just create greater alignment in that. And, and eventually you sometimes get business growth that comes out of that too. I love to the two examples, almost at the extremes. You're talking about very low skilled labor that are making brownies for Ben and Jerry's. And you're talking about you know, highly capable knowledge workers working on innovation projects within Fortune 500. And you're like, guess what? When we change the approach, like it can work regardless of what type of business or what size or the nature of the it's this is more about a, a philosophical approach to being naive, a willingness to go there. It's 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 a beautiful thing. Well said. Thanks, man. Well, Joshua, I'm going to ask you the easiest question. We don't need to, any sort of belief or naivete on this one. Where can my listeners go to learn more about you and about the book? <laughs> Thanks. The best book website is daretobenaive.com. And uh, you can find it now out at any of the online retailers. Uh, you can find it in airports and a number of different places. Uh, I'm most active on LinkedIn. And so if you look for me, Josh Berry, uh, on LinkedIn, um, our company's name is Econic, E-C-O-N-I-C. -E so if you find Josh Barry and Econic out there on LinkedIn, you'll likely find a lot of the content that I put out. And I'm going to save you a step, listeners. I got those links for you Sweet. in the show notes. Super so mad. We'll, get, to, we'll Super get you right to Joshua. We'll get you right to his excellent book. Joshua, thank you so much for spending some time with me today. I've really learned a lot. I always do from you. I really appreciate having you on. Matt, this was, this was a blessing. You are the godfather, man. <laughs>